Hello everyone and welcome to the D edition of Speech Leech, where I'll be talking about the next four languages, one of which is going to be crowned the winner and the one I'll be learning over the course of the next two weeks. But first, let's talk about last week's winner, and that is Choctaw. I'll probably be releasing this in two parts just like last week's video, because the videos just get way too long and it's only appropriate that a winner gets their few minutes of fame, I think. Choctaw was a friggin' difficult language, let me tell ya. The whole weird word order and the word creation thing would definitely take my European brain to get used to a little bit. Also, like Albanian and Bulgarian had Google Translate going for them, Choctaw, not so much. Vibrant with warrior culture, the Choctaw have played a significant role in the development of the United States as a whole, with their famed general Pushmataha as an example, among others, as well as perhaps even in the development of the world with their courageous co-talkers during the world wars. However, the Choctaw are more than that, with rich and colorful traditions found nowhere else. Now, I'm not 100% sure how these numbers add up exactly, but from the sources that I've seen online, there are about 160,000 people who identified as at least part Choctaw in the United States. According to the 2010 census, there were people who identified as Choctaw in every state of the United States, Oklahoma having by far the largest percentage, followed by Texas and California. Though officially, the three main federally recognized Choctaw tribes in the United States were the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma with approximately 223,000 plus enrolled members, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians with approximately 10,000 members, and the Jenna Band of Choctaw Indians in Louisiana with just about 240 members. By the way, Oklahoma comes from the Choctaw words Okla and Homa, meaning red people, and was a Choctaw word used to describe all Native Americans collectively, similar to the English word Indian. Additionally though, there are the Choctaw Pod of Ebard and the Bayou Lacombe Choctaw both in Louisiana, the Live Oak Choctaw in Mississippi, and the Moa Band of Choctaw Indians in Alabama. And out of all of these numbers, as of 2015, there were approximately 9,600 speakers of the Choctaw language, the majority of whom were over the age of 45. The Choctaw further subdivided into several clans, or Iskas, governed by a matrilineal kinship system, meaning that the child born would be taking on their mother's social status instead of their father's. John Swanton, an anthropologist in the early 1930s, wrote, Adam Hutchson told that there were tribes of families among the Indians somewhat similar to the Scottish clans, such as the panther family, the bird family, the raccoon family, the wolf family. Choctaw is written using the Latin script, though with some modifications, like underlined vowels meaning nasalized, the V looking thing is another vowel, and the HL making a k sound, kind of like the Welsh double L. And as part of the Muscogean language family, distantly related to the Alabama language, briefly discussed in the A edition of the Honorable Mentions video, the Choctaw were considered to be one of the five civilized tribes of the United States, along with the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole. This is because these were among the first five to have adopted some attributes of the colonists, such as Christianity, literacy, intermarriage with white Americans, and others, some of which were not so nice. It's crazy how you can call someone civilized and then turn around and trail of tears an Indian remove them away from their homes to Oklahoma just a few years later. Like, who wants to live in Oklahoma? To briefly summarize the whole Trail of Tears and Indian Removal Act stuff, basically hundreds of thousands of people, among them the Choctaw, but also many other tribes, were removed from their ancestral homelands to the works of a million complex, very shady and unfair treaties and sent into designated reservations, many of them dying along the way. The first one such was the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek of 1830, which saw the majority of the Choctaw sent away from the native homelands in the southern United States to places like Oklahoma. Some, though, decided to remain in Mississippi and the surrounding areas, and it's at this point that the Choctaw now essentially split into two, the nation in Oklahoma and the tribe in Mississippi. The nation was to retain autonomy and govern itself, while members of the tribe were to become one of the first non-European populations to become United States citizens. The Choctaw were welcomed with open arms, granted full rights, government support, and none of it is true, I lied. But come on, this is 19th century United States, how believable would that really be? Joseph B. Cobb, a settler who moved to Mississippi from the state of Georgia, described the Choctaw as having no nobility or virtue at all, and in some respect, he found blacks, especially native Africans, more interesting and admirable. The red man superior in every way. The Choctaw and Chickasaw, the tribes he knew best, were beneath contempt, that is, even worse than black slaves. On a lighter note, another insane chapter of Choctaw history is how in 1847, when Ireland was going through the potato famine and the Great Hunger, the Choctaw tribe chipped in and donated about $170, which would be equivalent to about $5,300 of today's money. Super cool of them, considering that the Choctaw were doing pretty bad themselves during those times, having endured the Trail of Tears just not long before. The Middleton Town Council and County Court... Say that five times fast. The Middleton Town Council of County Cork, Ireland, commissioned this beautiful sculpture titled Kindred Spirits, and you can see it in Baelic Park in Middleton. How wholesome is that? But now back to the language. 
just like many other Native American languages, there's going to be many verbs and many long words and a million prefixes, suffixes, and infixes collectively known as affixes. Prefixes mainly indicate agreement type stuff, so like gender, number, class, etc. Infixes mainly indicate aspect type stuff, so like tense. And suffixes mainly indicate all other complicated semantic linguistic type stuff like modality, valence, and evidentiality, which is a fascinating feature. Take for example the sentence nipi awashishi, which means she fried meat where the suffix he at the end indicated that I, myself, directly, first-hand, saw, heard, or smelled her doing it. Then consider nipi awashi tok asha, which means the exact same thing, except the tok asha at the end indicates that I didn't see her frying meat myself before telling you, I'm just kind of guessing, somebody, somebody told me about it. Chahta anumpa achiba ayalhi, America banali ia kanima chahta ut ahanta, hiatuko Banali afama kana chata anumpoli katima ya lachi nanta pisa lachi halito chi hochifo hot nanta so hochifo hot shon yakoke on kio chipisa lachike him mak nitak nitak holo nakfish pokoli tuklo tachlapi at April pilashash Wak nipi upa lituk yimahe al pesa. Himmak nitak ya umba ho shikia. Kuche ya chi bona ho. Achufa tuklo tuchina oshta tashlapi hanali on tuklo on tuchina chakali pokoli. Hata inla micha lusa lusagbi homa homagbi lakna lakna hata okchamali okchakbi. So, ki ishki ita tuklo, ofi tuklo ishi, hochifo luk michasheli. Himonasi, impotkil ilkoli, hachofoli, hachofoli. That was tough. And I can't even be 100% certain that some of the stuff that I said is even correct. And there's really no way for me to check other than hunting down a fluent native speaker, which I failed to do this episode. <laughs> Also the spelling in some of these words might be a bit weird if any Choctaw people are watching because every website gave me slightly different spellings of the same words, so I don't know. Honestly, this legit might be the most difficult language I've ever attempted, mainly because of the difficulty, but also because of lack of resources. Don't get me wrong, there's still plenty, like a surprising amount for Chokta, but it's not like a European language where there's a million dictionaries and translation services available online at all times. Probably the main source I used to learn Chokta is this website, which doesn't exist anymore, and I had to go on the Wayback Machine and search through archives to actually dig up the lessons that they had there. In any case, that's it for Chokta, and now we're moving on to next week's choices of the letter D.